you gonna just take me back to that day? Take you back to that day. Take me back to okay. 9 11, 2000. <clears throat> well, that day, I had to get up very early. I, I was the opening agent. In other words, I had to be there 4.30 in the morning to get all the computers up and running to, you know, unlock all the uh, cash drawers and this, that, and the other thing to, for the opening, to start checking in passengers. And I remember when I, when I stepped outside that morning, I went, oh my God, this is, it was a perfect morning. The sun hadn't come up yet because it was still very early. But you could feel the air was crystal clear and, 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 and just cool. There was a snap in here. It was wonderful. And it turned out to be a spectacular day. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. And uh, also because this was the first weekend after Labor Day that year, you know, the, there were hardly any people there. You know, you were, for weeks and weeks and weeks, you were getting a horde of people every morning. But now that the main season was over, you, uh, I, I walked in and there was only like, believe it or not, at 4.30, there were six or eight people there. And I went, oh good, <laughs> this is good. This is not a big match crowd. So I got the uh, shop open and uh, I started, checking in our passengers. There are two other agents that joined me shortly after, after that. And uh, the great thing was it wasn't a busy day. So we had about six or seven flights between 6 a.m. and like seven something. Mm. So usually there was a lot of people. There was hardly any. So we had three people working on it. We quickly worked through the uh, passengers for all the flights. <laughs> you know, you, you, the week prior to that, you didn't have time to change your mind, but uh, th this was nice that you, that you could uh, finally see the end of the line and then chat with each other. But uh, that was when I decided I was going to step outside. I still smoked at the time, and I decided I was going to step outside and have a cigarette because there was a lull. And as I'm leaving the ticket counter, I see two fellas looking around like they don't know where they're going. And uh, I said, what, what airline are you guys on? And he says, US Air. I said, where are you going? They said, Boston. Well, I said, oh. It's after 5.30, the flight's leaving at six. And I said, oh, you guys get to come over here. So I went back to the counter and uh, I said, oh, good thing I'm checking them in. I was working the first class counter, uh, and they were, it's for high mileage people and people with first class tickets. Mm -hmm. So I said, oh, good thing I'm here. Because they had like $2,400 tickets. And you, know, you rarely see them. And, they, that, and also another strange thing, which was becoming strange at the time, is they had paper tickets. And you were seeing less and less paper tickets, even at, even that time, even at that time. So I had him step up to the counter, and I said, "Okay, well, uh, let me see your tickets." And I looked at the tickets, and I went, "Ooh, okay, they're going to L.A. by way of Boston." And uh, then I. Ask them the questions. You know, I don't know if you remember the questions you had asked. Refresh my memory. Okay, you'd have to, each passenger had to be asked these questions. Has anyone no, unknown to you asked you to carry an item on board the aircraft for them? And the answer to that would be no. And have any of your bags been out of ex, out of your sight since you packed them? And you had to say no to that. And this was so that, you know, people wouldn't sneak stuff on the planes or stiff something in people's bags. So um, they both said no. Well, Acha said no. And the other kid just went, no, you know. I don't even think he understood what I was saying, to be honest with you. He just went, no, no. 
so then I told her, I, I says, well, do you have any baggage to check? And um, yeah, they had a bag each. So then I started processing the baggage. And when you do that, you get the boarding cards. So their bag tags come up. And because it was so late, you know, for check-in, I had to add another tag to their baggage tag to indicate that these bags are not to be loaded on the plane unless it's verified that these passengers are actually on board the plane because they showed up late. So we got that done. And uh, then I asked them to see their IDs. Now, the younger guy, his name was Abdul Aziz Alomari. He was probably maybe mid to late 20s, you know. And uh, when he held it, I thought it funny, when he held his ID up, he held it up next to his face like this and he smiled, <laughs> like he was, you know, in the picture. Yeah, okay, fine. The other guy, Atta, he had a miserable look on his face. Oh, he was, he had a miserable look on his face the whole time I, I was dealing with him. Uh, it seemed like he really didn't want to be here, although I know he did now. Um, but he, he just looked at you like side. He never looked directly at you. He was always looking at the side and he's got a smirk on his face and he threw his driver's license up on the counter. And uh, Okay, fine. I look at him and I'm saying, okay, he looks like a bottle of poison, you know, <laughs> the face he's got on. And that's when I, 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 I made a mental comment to myself. And I said, if this guy don't look like an Arab terrorist, nobody does. And that thought actually went through my mind. And then I gave myself a uh, politically correct slap for even thinking that. And just, he's just the guy, he's going to LA on business, you know, I don't know. So, uh, I, I tagged the bag, sent them on the way, checked the IDs, uh, set up their boarding cards. Now, there was a new procedure, a fairly new procedure, in effect at that time. The major airlines had starting they're starting to agree with uh, giving what we call downline offline, which means that the person is going to another city and catching another flight. In other words, they're not going to LA on US Airways, they're going on American, and they're going out of Boston, not out of here. So Boston is downline and American is offline. That new agreement was that passengers checking in here can get their boarding cards on their offline airline out of Boston. We would have them here. I didn't like the policy because it eliminated a step in what I call the security procedure. In other words, they don't, after me, they don't see anybody for any kind of security reason. You know, because once you check in and you go, you're inside the security perimeter. And I'm saying, that's not right. They should have to check in with American. I don't work for American. So uh, I set them up from here to Boston with their boarding cards, their bag tags, their boarding envelopes, and I started sending them on their way. And I said, okay, you know, go up to gate six and you better hurry up. And that's when he, uh, uh, Atta looked at the envelopes, then he looked at me and he says, they told me one step check-in. And that was that new procedure they, that they have going. It's called one step check-in. In other words, you can check in here and you don't have to check in anywhere else. And I said, oh God, he knows, he knows I have his boarding cards here. Or he thinks he knows them. And he wants me to give them to him. I didn't want to give them to him. So I said, look, um, you're in first class out of America, and you get down to America, you go right to the Admiral's Club. They'll take really good care of you there. You know, you're in a first class cabin. And he just tensely 
looking at me. He says, they told me one step check in. And I'm going, oh boy. Uh, I don't want to get into confrontation with this guy. He's a miserable looking person. And uh, so I said, well, let me try this. I said, Mr. Atta, your flight is leaving very shortly. If you don't get upstairs real quick, you're going to miss your flight altogether. Check in with American Airlines in Boston. And I think that part about you're going to miss your flight altogether convinced him to turn right around and get upstairs. And that was the end of my dealing with them at the ticket counter. When did you, when do you remember making the connection that those oh. were the guys? Well, a couple hours later, um, it's real quiet, you know. A couple hours later, um, a gal from Continental, I know, she was leaving, she was getting off work, and she says, she says to me, as she's walking by, she says, did you see what happened down in New York? I says, no, I didn't. She says, an airplane crashed into the World Trade Center. And your mind doesn't register right away. You don't think commercial airliner. You think, you know, a small private plane, even maybe even a small private jet. You don't think about a, a 757 or any, you know, it doesn't. And I says, what, you know, how many, a lot of people get killed? She says, it was a commercial plane. And I was just struck. It's astounding that a commercial plane holding maybe 200 people or more struck the World Trade Center. And she says, yeah, go look on TV. So I went in the back room and, looked, and as I'm watching the second plane struck, it was flight 11 out of Boston. And it didn't register right away. But a girl I was working with, Diane, she says, hey, Tui, because I told her about these two guys, you know, how about, you know, they were kind of, eh, I didn't want to get into it with them. She says, hey, Tui, didn't you check two guys in on that flight? And I stopped. <sighs> and uh, I thought about it. My initial reaction is, geez, I feel so bad for these guys. And then it hit me, that thought I had about Arab terrorists. And I went, I was right. There were Arab terrorists. And it just uh, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Well, right away, the guilt, what did I miss? How come I didn't see this, you know? And of course, it hadn't been confirmed yet, but you know, when are you going to see two commercial planes fly into the World Trade Center accidentally? So yeah, that, that, that's when I first realized that first I'm feeling bad for them that they died in such a horrible way. And then I realized, oh, my gut reaction, my gut feeling about these, this guy was right. Yeah. It was a horrible feeling. We were talking before we were rolling about your time working with the airlines. Yeah. Why did you want? Why did you want to get into this work? Into the airline industry? Yeah. Oh my God. It was. It, it at the time. Now I went to work in nineteen. You're talking nineteen sixty-seven. I had just gotten out of the military. And. Um, I, I, I took a civil service exam for Boston Police Department. And of course, I get a little extra score for being a veteran, and I scored high on the test, and I wanted to be a Boston cop. I grew up in Boston. So, uh, I don't know, the guy tells me, he's Mike, we got, we're gonna put a, a, a class together for, you know, police officers, you know, school, and you, you, you might want to take a temporary job there until you can, until uh, we call you. I said, okay, fine. So this temporary job, a friend of mine 
her, her father, her father told me, he said, look, go in there and fill out a, an application, tell them I sent you. Okay, good. Of course, I got the job. Working for the airline in them days, you didn't walk in and get a job. No. no. Somebody had to recommend you. And you didn't take this job just as a, uh, you know, temporary thing. It was a career. It was, you guaranteed, in the airline industry back then, good pay, good benefits, and a million laughs a day. It was probably the most fun job you could have had back then, as compared to what it's turned into, you know. But yeah, that, that was uh, enforced. I was still waiting for the call from the academy, but I remember one time, uh, me and a friend, we went over to Eastern Airlines at the time, stepped up to the counter, 20 bucks, round trip, first class to Puerto Rico, $20. We got 75% off our hotel at the best hotel in Puerto Rico at the time, right? You rented a car, 75% off. And then I come back and I'm saying, ah, I'm not going to be a cop. <laughs> you know? I'm not going to walk the streets of Boston with a gun on my hip and everybody hates you. You know, and as you started taking advantage of all the benefits of working in the online industry, and it was, it was just a fabulous thing. You, you, you didn't walk in off the street and get a job there. Somebody had to recommend you. And it was. It was a sensational job. You know? Sorry, I'm just going to take you all in. Take you all in. How do you... How do you get through your days? Now? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, it's it, okay now. It's, uh, does it still, it, do you still think about it? Well, I tell you what, I, yeah, of course I got to think about it every now and then, but um, especially since everything you see happening in the news today started on that day. All the stuff in Afghanistan. This is just a continuation of what happened on 9-11, if you think about it. You can draw a direct line to it. But uh, at first, I had quite uh, quite a lot of psycholo psychological problems, you know, because I did uh, uh, ask myself that question about, oh, don't these guys look like Arab terrorists? And I let it go because I did a gut check, and you know, it wasn't true. And I um, carried around a lot of guilt. What did I miss? How come I didn't stop them? You know, all of that. And um, at first, another thing, another thing about that day was my wife was a flight attendant for American Airlines at that time. It's, it's, well, U.S. Airways, I'm sorry, U.S. Airways at that time. And she was out of town. And when you think about what happened that day, I, was, I mean, it was awful, the incident itself. But the repercussions from that incident, the entire airline industry in the world, but especially in the United States, was shut down. Remember, they told every airline, wherever you are, land at the nearest airport, never mind going to where you're going. That is astounding. There were, what, 13 planes up in Bangor that, you know, way too big for Bangor. And, I don't know how many planes were landing and all, and these were all these transatlantic flights. They were big 747s, big, big planes, right? And that's an immediate repercussion of that. And my wife was stuck out of town. She's on a, you know, she's flying. Is she okay? Because now they're thinking, how many other planes are going to be attacked? Because you had the other plane in the Pentagon and another in Pennsylvania. Now the government said, whoa, we have to put a stop to this. Every plane, find your closest airport and land. Do not, and if you're, if you're just leaving, turn back. You know? Can you think of any other time, just w with your time in that career, that they've had to do something like that? Oh, that's the one and only. That is the one and only time that ever happened. That's, uh, uh, they've had flights divert maybe for 
you know, a flight here or a flight there because some action on board the aircraft or like the uh, the guy, the shoe bomber guy <laughs> and uh, other incidents like that, but never ever an, a total industry shutdown for, I think they shut it down four or five days. There was not a plane flying. It, it was shut down for so long, the atmosphere actually cleared up. It had an effect on, on fog and smog and everything else like that. It's amazing. So then, uh, you know, that's another thing. It compounds my guilty conscience, you know. So uh, I had to have somebody to talk to. So I called my mother. <laughs> With the day, that day, I went home. You know, I went home from work that day, and I had to go back because the FBI wanted to talk to me. And I, I called my mother, and I, I told her what happened. And she says, "What's?" She says to me, "Why are you crying?" And I told her what happened. And she said, "What's that got to do with you?" Now <laughs> she's ninety years old. And she says, "I'll be right up." I says, how are you going to get up there? I'll get up there. Don't worry about it. Sure enough, she got my youngest brother, had him pick her up, and she drove up to Maine. Right? And, uh, how was, did, that, did that bring you comfort, having her here? Oh, to have your mother wrap around, little tiny woman, wrap around around you and say, everything's OK. It's not your fault. didn't take all the guilt away, but it's, uh, it's your mother. She says it's okay. It must be okay, you know. And that was, uh, it, it didn't take all the gray clouds away, but it, it certainly, and she stayed with me for, <laughs> she stayed with me until my wife got home, you know, her and my brother. So then I had to deal with that psychological, I, I went to four psychologists over the years. Do you are you comfortable sharing any of Oh, no, 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 they did, they, they did what they could. Yeah. But, the, you know, the, the first three, they said, look, if, if, they all told me this thing, you have very profound PTSD. And they even admitted, I'm not prepared to deal with that, you know. You might have to see a psychiatrist about this. Ah, shaking my head, I don't want to see a psychiatrist, so. But, um, Eventually, I, had, I found a one guy, and he had uh, a, a, he helped me a lot, a lot. And he had this gadget. You put it in your ears, and it sits on your chest, and he does this retrogression of, uh, you know, go back to the day. And I could see it almost as clearly, as clearly as can be. And I can almost hear verbatim what was said, you know. And, that helped. That was very cathartic. And I found out that talking about it was very, very good. You know, it, it, it let it out there. Finally, uh, I got to the point where the only time I really give it a lot of thought is on an anniversary. And the fact that so much, in, uh, the fact that the government so knew so much about this incident, it, 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 it enraged me. Well, after everything's, you know, once I get interviewed by the FBI, <clears throat> you know, and uh, uh, now that now I'm going to have to testify before the 9-11 Commission. <clears throat> and the news stories are coming out that on August 6th, right, a full month before this incident, at the, what they call the presidential PDB, Presidential Daily Briefing. Uh, it was brought up that there were Arabic gentlemen, a lot of Arabic gentlemen, in and around the World Trade Centers taking pictures and, you know, it just seemed like there was a lot of, there was a lot of chatter on all of the Arabic uh, networks about Allah is going to be taking revenge and Allah, you, you'll soon see what Allah will bring upon the infidels, uh, right? And then another thing was, there were report, and, and the reports of Arabic men out in Arizona 
taking flying lessons, but they weren't too keen on landing. They just wanted to learn how to fly the plane. And I'm saying if that doesn't ring every alarm in your, in, you know, every alarm should go off when you hear that. And nothing was done. There should have been, they should have allowed, told the airlines that there were strange Arabic men. We used to get briefings every day, right? And do not fly this and this, that, and the other thing. And uh, if they had told us, or remember they had level one, level two, level three. I think just on that briefing, they should have brought us up to level three. Level four was, you know, hair on fire, but level three, so, you know. You get some Arabic guys want to know how to fly planes. They don't care about landing. They just want to know how to fly them. Can you explain the levels one, two, three? Can you explain that to me? Well, if I can go back, uh, level one was just normal. Things are procedure. They have no um, um, advisories of any uh, crazy stuff going on. Uh, from here, there, or everywhere. They have no particular individuals that they're looking for, although that's not true. Um, and that's going routine. Level two, it's, it, it's slightly enhanced. Uh, you might be on the look, you know, you have to be on the lookout for somebody who's got a one way ticket paid for with cash. Or they may be advised, you know, they may have gotten a word that there's a a group out there who plan to do this or that or the other thing. Level three was you, you pay close scrutiny to who the people are that you're talking with, you know, who you're dealing with. Make sure their IDs are correct. Make sure the tickets are not one-way cash tickets that were purchased just recently. You know, and even on the tickets that they handed me, I looked at the tickets <coughs> and I saw that they were first-class tickets paid for with a credit card, but that was three weeks prior to this. So there's no suspicion in them tickets at all, you know. Um, and level four was, uh, you give close scrutiny, you open people's bags. It's when you're starting to open people's bags and dumping out the content. If there's a thing comes up on the computer, there was, the computers did all the cross-referencing, you know. And if a computer says, dump the bag, you took, it, you took the bag over to uh, a security place that was set up years ago. They had security that back then even. And you dumped the bag and you went through everybody's bag. Then they packed it you know, back to work. But that was level four and that, uh, you didn't see a lot of level four, you know, because it slowed everything way down, you know. And of course the industry is itself worked on Everything is on timing, you know. Get them checked in, get a check, bags checked, load and unload the planes, fuel it, you know, cater it, get the people on board, let's go, you know. Uh, but uh, once you had to go to level four, it all depends on how many bags you had to have dumped. And then, of course, when the people went up to security, they were given extra screening when they were going through security also, you know. So their bags got thoroughly checked and then they got thoroughly checked upstairs. That's when they had to start, when they started, you know, take your shoes off, take your belt off, uh, stuff like that. That was after, that was after the... Oh, that was, that was uh, at that time, but not everybody had it. It was only the people who got flagged for security by your computer downstairs, okay. you know. Now that could have happened to Atta and the other guy, Alamari, uh, but it didn't. But if I had, if he had actually hesitated when he asked that second time for a boarding cut, there was a key I could have hit, and that would have set him up to, basically, he would have missed the flight. Because then they would have had to dump their bags, and they would, they never would have made it if they had to search their bags. So. Uh, yeah, a lot of that, you know, I deal with it pretty, pretty well now. Um, yeah, I, like I said, it's, it's, it's in the past. I wish people would think of this, not just as a 20-year anniversary, 
people are getting so lax now. It's uh, it's not good. I was going to ask you about kind of your feelings on how things have changed. Well, the thing that I have seen is uh, we have become a nation of ent entitled people. You know. Uh, you know, you're stepping on my First Amendment rights, huh? No, no, uh, uh, yeah. I got the right to carry a gun, and I got, you know, every, you know, I got the right to do this, I got the right to do that, you know. Wait a minute. You're talking about, uh, uh, now, not just in, you see all the stuff going on board on aircraft now. Fist fights, and, you know, uh, I don't want to wear a mask, and, uh, what do you mean? Oh, it's my right not to wear a mask. Well, it says, the airline says, you've got to wear a mask or not, right? You can't, you know, when it said you can't smoke and you didn't smoke, did you? Well, some people tried, <laughs> you know. But uh, there's a lot of people out there who feel that they're entitled to certain liberties that other people aren't entitled to be. And they're getting a little lax on not the industry itself, just think about it. There were people, there were several hundred times a year, they find people with guns. Uh, how stupid do you have to be to carry a gun on board, try to carry a gun on board an aircraft, you know? And uh, people, are, I, I think, are getting a little lax on their security. And don't think that these guys, uh, these, I don't know, you call them the Taliban, you call them Al-Qaeda, you call they watch everything that's being done over here to see what you can get away with. And I think that they rehearsed that hijacking back then, all the procedures, so they knew all the procedures. That's how he knew I had his boarding cards. They had rehearsed it, probably flying here and there and everywhere else, till they know, okay, this is what we can expect when we go here and there, you know? Okay, we'll, we'll, I think the reason uh, they all split up was they didn't want a whole bunch of Arabic guys walking down the, down the uh, hallway at the same time would bring attention to them. So you had some check-in in Boston, you had some check-in in Portland and fly to Boston, you know, and then they didn't hang around with each other in the boarding area, you know. Uh, they don't want to attract any attention because they know American people now think every Arab, every Arab is a hijack, you know. And if you see eight of them all together, hey, who are all these guys, you know? But uh, I, don't know. I just hope people smarten up. I don't know if they, they, they smarten up. I don't. I, I'm of course. I, I don't think the government's doing anything to take away anything from me, you know? Hey, they took away my freedom when they drafted me. They sent me off to war, see? I said, well, it's an obligation I have. You know, I didn't say, well, you take my, you know, they, when they were sticking, how's this? When I stuck my arm out and they punctured me with, I think, uh, 14 shots when I got drafted, right? Were they taking away my First Amendment rights not to have shots or something, you know? People complain about things like now that I, I, I just don't understand them. I don't, you know? Maybe we should have more polio, more scarlet fever, you know? If we had more of them around and people were actually seeing people die of these diseases, they'd say, oh, maybe vaccine is good, you know? But it's a, it's a change, it's a, a big change from 2001 To the generations that have come since since then, I, I, I don't know who instilled in them these ideas that, uh, you know, you can do anything you want. And I think it's going to get us in trouble one of these days. To bring you back to that day again. Yeah. What did it feel like? Like, did the, did the room change? Did... Did anything, I know you said your gut kind of went off. Yeah. But how did, how did everybody that you were working with, what was the response in there from everybody? Oh, 
everybody was just slack jawed. Who's just what? Slack jawed, you know. Uh, their jaw dropped, you know, slack jawed. Because you're watching, it, it, to watch on the screen what you were seeing, I don't think, you, your mind is not ready to wrap itself around that. You, you can't comprehend that that would ever in a million years. And what got to me the most is when I went home, um, I turned the TV on, of course. And I'm watching this. You know, the smoke billowing everywhere, the, the, the whole island, the, 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 everything just covered in smoke and dust. And there's no way out. You have to take a choice. Do you, you, you're wrestling with your soul. Do I jump and get it over quickly, or do I burn to death? And the ones that had to jump, you know, they're wrestling with their conscience just to, and that, and that just, I lost it there. It's, it's, it's just, overcoming, overwhelming, to think that a person would have to make that kind of choice with their own life. It was a horror show. I can't imagine. Oh, watching it was just horrid, horrid. And I'm saying, and then they showed some, then, then of course you see the film of the guy halfway down there going head first and going, oh, unbelievable. Unbelievable. Any more? When September 11th comes around every year, what does it bring up for you? What does it bring up for me? Actually, uh, um, what does it make you feel? I, I well, I, one thing I do feel is. Good because there hasn't been another situation like that. You know, I'm saying all this stuff is good that, uh, you know, they've got the security in place, even though people don't like it you know, and they get a little taciturn about it. Uh, but on a, on a level of me thinking, I think about it. Of course, I think. But I, I can remember recently, uh, within the last few years, I remember I woke up one, I didn't even realize, I didn't think it was September, I was camping somewhere. You know, and uh, somebody else brought it up to me. He says, "Hey, it's 9/11. You, you said you know it's 9/11." I said, "I did not until you told me." <laughs> you know, so it's it's uh, it's one of those things that you know I've dealt with it. You know, I play by the rules, and uh, my head is clear. I, it took me a while. I wasn't responsible. It's not my fault. And uh, the, another good thing is, uh, you see, uh, I don't know if you've ever Googled your name, but back a uh, while, well, you know, back, I'd Google my name and I'd see 100,000 responses at one time. Whew, 100,000. And yeah, and a newspaper in Bombay, and a newspaper, you know. Your name, you know, the, the local news, the Bombay news, the uh, people who are critical of uh, 
uh, what I did that morning, uh, you know, a lot of stuff. But now you hardly ever, you know, I can Google my name, and I haven't done it in so long, I don't even know how many references there are to it, you know, which means it's good. People forget about it. Well, not that they forget about it, but they forget me anyway, you know. Do you want them to forget you? Well, they can't now. I'm immortal. As long as there's the United States. I have found out, which I didn't even realize, uh, when, I, when CNN called me in 2004, because they called me and says, uh, is this Mike Toy? I says, yeah. I says, uh, she says, are you the guy who was working 9-11? I says, yeah, that's me. She says, um, how come nobody's ever heard of you? I says, have you ever given a TV interview? Or and I says, no. And he says, how is that? I says, well, I told the FBI not to mention my name if they could keep it out. And I guess they must have kept it out because it was three years later. Nobody ever contacted me. And then they asked me if they could do something. Yeah, I did it with Paul Azan at that time. And um, they told me, do you know that your name is the first name mentioned in the 9-11 Commission <laughs> report? And I said, oh, I didn't know that. I don't have a copy of that. And she said, yeah, that goes in the, ho that goes in the Library of Congress for all time. I said, oh, swell. <laughs> I'm immortal now. You know? Mm. It's almost like you need a sense of humor to. You have to have a sense of, you know, well, this is another thing that's going wrong here. The, the country has lost its sense of humor. Come on, you got to laugh at something, folks. You know, some things are maybe a little this way, a little that way, you know, but it's still funny, you know? Do you think laughter's gotten you through a lot of things? Well, I think, you know what's gotten me through a lot of this? Uh, my wife and I have now been married 23 years. Boy, has that been good. You know, I've had a, somebody who knew me before and knew, now knows me afterwards all of these years. I've had, uh, well, I've had true friends. Now, these are friends that are not, not, you didn't meet them six months ago, a year ago, and nothing. I've had friends that I've had for 60 plus years, right? They, they, it's still like this. You know, we still see each other some irregularly. You don't have to be with each other every day. You might call, maybe a week later you call. And you might not see him again till uh, winter. But the thing is, it's, it's your friends. And the, the sad thing is uh, I lost my best, best friend last July. Not, not last July, the July before. Him and I have been like joined at the hip for 64 years. And... Uh, so that was a, a big, big loss. And I got some, I still have some left, but th these are guys from Boston that I grew up with. We've known each other since we were 10, 11, 12 years old. We, sti we still stay in semi-regular contact. You know, we know every child and grandchild, and uh, you know, we go to a lot of weddings. Unfortunately, we go to a lot of funerals. More funerals than weddings these days, you know, which is sad find myself now, you know, years ago when I was young, you know, you sit at a table and you'd notice the old, the old people over there at the table. Now I'm at that table, you know, I'm at the old guy's table, you know. But uh, the good thing is, is, is good friends, you know. And, you know, the fact that, you know, that I don't dwell on it. I can't dwell on it. If you dwell on it, you go crazy. You know, and a good act of life. I've had a good act of life up till now, you know. Getting 75 though, you slow down, you know, somewhat. Do you have anything else from that day that sticks out to you or <sighs> Well, let me see. Uh, you want to share with people who are Okay, okay, we, we covered the check and we covered the, 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 the profound, yeah. Well, the, I had to go back to the airport once. I, I went home and I had to go back to the airport because I never gave it a thought. Well, Mike, do you know the FBI wants to talk to you? <laughs> oh, okay. What was that like for you? Uh, well, I, 
I said, geez, why didn't I, I should have known that. Why didn't I go home? I should have known the FBI was going to get called in on this. But uh, I understood. I was saying, okay, I, I can understand that. But I, I, I found they had a, a at my check-in point, there was a camera right above me. And I says, you know what? I was right below this camera. You should be able to hear and see everything I said that we was said there. He said, okay, good. And I found, oh, that camera wasn't working. Oh, so now I had a, uh, actually I went back at like one and I was there till like eight o'clock being interviewed by the FBI and uh, uh, I had to go over the uh, checkpoint, the, the video of the checkpoint, and pick them out as they were coming through. And the strange thing about that is when they were in front of me, they had on like ties and jackets, right? When they went through the checkpoint, they had on sports shirts. So somewhere between the counter and the security point, they took their jackets and ties off. I don't know why. Why would they do that? I don't know. And there's no footage that shows it now. Is there footage that shows that now? It, sh it shows them going through security, security with sports shirts on. Right. But they had jackets and ties on in front of me. Right. And that video is not there, you said. Oh, no. There's no video there. You know? So between... <clears throat> I mean, I can see how they could easily do it. If they did it as they were walking and they were stuffing them into uh, their carry-on bags. Okay, but people ask me why, and I I don't know. <laughs> Maybe they wanted to, somebody to be confused when they looked at the video and say, and, and I even said that to them. I says, look, I'll tell you what, these guys had on jackets and ties at the counter, but that's them in the sports shirts right there, one behind the other, you know? So I don't know. Maybe it was just to obfuscate things, you know, make it a little less clear you know, my image of them in front of me with the jackets and ties, that image of them going through security with just sports shirts on. You know, actually not sports shirts, dress shirts. They were dress shirts. Yeah. But uh, outside of that, no, it just, uh, that's about all I can think of that we covered. Uh, I'm a happy man today. I'm, I, don't, uh, I don't dwell on it. Like I said, I just, really good. Oh, I just lead the good life here. I'm, you know, I'm, as far as I'm concerned, I'm living large here. Because you know? <laughs> I came from housing projects in Boston to this. You know, worked all the way. I'm curious about your first day back at work. What's that again? Your first day back at work. Oh, my first day back at work. Yeah, that was, um, <clears throat> well, initially, I went back to work the next day. I showed up for work the next day. And, of course, you have no flights, no planes, no this, no that. But you still had people showing up because now their flights were canceled and they need to be reaccommodated. And the bad thing was, you don't know how long the industry is going to be shut down. You know, you, you, the government didn't give you any idea when they're going to reopen the skies. So, I, uh, people tend to getting angry. You know, actually, I could, I could get a bit of a temper too. I could get my Irish up pretty easily. And uh, not easily, but and I'm starting to say, oh, people are just annoying me now. And I'm thinking about what I had gone through the day prior. And I just tell my boss, I, I, says, I have to get out of here. I said, I can't. I said, I'm going to lose it with these people. I said, I, they don't seem to understand that there isn't much that I can do for them right now. And he told me, he says, take a few days off. So I did. I, 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 I was out for three days, you know, and I felt like a whole new man when I come back to really. I, I felt like a new person when I come back. I just, 
get all of that negativity out of myself, you know. And by that time, they were starting to open up the the airspace. You could you could actually deal with people and check them in and reaccommodate them and take care of them, you know. There, you know, so no. I was just thinking, there was a time when I remember the airport being closed, but it was a specific airport. It was Boston. It was not the whole system. The, during the blizzard of 78, New England was closed, <laughs> you know. If, I don't know if you're old enough to remember the blizzard of 78. I remember the ice storm of 98, but that was here. Ice storm, oh yeah, I was here, the ice storm, and I, yeah, yeah. Didn't lose power. You know, they're talking Lucky. about, you know, how, how's this? When this still was a little house, 1991, well, I've only been in here about a month, when Bob, Hurricane Bob hit. You've only been here how long? 30 years. Two. But Bob hit 30 years ago. Yeah. And I was in this house, I was dating this gal, and uh, I said, look, let's go to Blockbuster, <laughs> no more Blockbusters, rent a movie. And settle down, you know, cook up some food, maybe have pizza, burger, something for the hurricane. Well, while we were gone, I guess the police come down and they evacuated. It was mandatory evacuation for the whole road. And uh, we, were un we were unconscious. We come back, got the food ready, sat down, plopped in a video, a video cassette there. <laughs> and uh, the, the whole hurricane, we... Uh, electricity wavered, but we never lost it. But then I found out the neighbor says, oh, you were home? He says, yeah. He says, geez, the cops came, made us leave. <laughs> you know. oh. My cameras are dropping like flies right now. Yeah. Howdy. It's okay. It's okay. Am I talking too much? <laughs> of course, but this is great. We talk to you all day. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> I got a lot of good stories, actually. <laughs> um, I just want to make sure that you feel like you've said everything you want to say. Yeah, basically, I... Uh, 20 years is a long... It's what's that? It's just been 20, 20 years. It's a long time, and it actually is... It puts more distance between what, you know, what I've been through and, 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 and today. But, uh, like I said, I... I I got a lot of counseling. I had a lot of had a good ma. You know, I had good friends, uh, and I've had an exciting, a pretty, I would say, exciting life in the last twenty years. You know, um, no regrets. You know, and, and I, I just hope nobody would ever have to go through what we went through and i mean the collective we as a nation would ever have to go through that again 